should be live now. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we are live. Looks like it. Great. Uh, I see 11 people should be here. Can you guys say hi if you can hear us properly and uh, see us properly? Check, check. Can people see us? No. Hear us? Check, check. Can anyone hear us? Hmm. Oh, hold on. So, yeah, okay. So, that's so weird. I'm not seeing the chat on YouTube, but I do see it on Streamlabs. All good. <laughs> Okay. Awkward. Let's uh, uh yeah, let's let's get started. Okay. So, uh, uh hi everyone. Synthex Academy, Roy here, Vlad uh, in Berlin. Yep. Um today we're going to work on a drum sequencer um that uh, Vlad designed based on the Spotikach uh, sampler that uh you might have seen on uh, the website i don't know if vlad can you maybe show it or can you play it to show what, what um i can here? i can play it probably it's harder to show it because it's in in a rack Yeah, so probably it's it's not that easy to understand what it's actually doing without without seeing it. But yeah, yeah, but but it's, it's basically uh, it's it, it's like it, it has the, these um, um, uh, pre-generated rhythms um, that you created or like you can actually manipulate in in real time. Uh, yeah, so it's it's uh, more or less like mix of the looper and uh, like yeah rhythm generator. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to work with a simple fixed board. If you guys don't know uh, what that is, it's basically a very small board um, that is designed for getting started with synth DIY. Uh, you can find it on our website. Um, uh, if you don't know the organization, Synthex Academy is a nonprofit based in the Netherlands. Um, and these kits is how we actually um, uh, can allow for ourselves to actually run these workshops. Um, yeah, uh, last time we had a workshop with Vlad, we gave uh, a little challenge for people uh, if they wanted to uh, build a um, synth inspired by the workshop. Um, and uh, I think Vlad is going to take over and maybe show um, what we did and uh, what, what came out of, uh, of, of this challenge. Um, and right after that, we're going to continue with the workshop. So uh, let's get started. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, so yeah, as uh, Roy just mentioned, uh, we will start with uh, presenting uh, the uh, work that uh, uh, is uh, part um, 
uh, that Ben sent us as a, a part of this uh, challenge to uh, to build um, RPGator. And yeah, so this uh, and this RPGator is built in um, pure data. Yeah, and we can uh, listen how it sounds. Um, there are different um, different like predefined patterns here. So and uh, you can switch between them. So it's really great. Uh, it, I would say this is really great a choice for uh, performance. Yes, yeah, so we have something something predefined. And also what I what I uh, like especially about uh, about the layout that uh, each of this um, uh, each of, uh, of this uh, uh, sets of voices uh, has like um, RPG iter nodes and also lead nodes and base nodes. Yeah, so there is already some structure predefined there. I I like to do it myself uh, to have some like so it's like uh, in, feels like in the middle of something that is totally controlled and something that uh, is more like improvis improvisational and. Uh, also, yeah, so uh, for me, when I first opened it, it's uh, I'm not a big expert in uh, pure data, but for me, what was actually great about it is that if we then go inside like this PD ideal module, it actually really expands into the into the module. So this structuring and uh, then here we have this ideal voice that uh, also uh, that also expands, and uh, yeah, I really like this uh, this like uh, reusability and structuring of the of the different modules. That uh, basically also what we are, what we are talking, uh, but with a with a code during this uh, during this uh, workshops. So yeah, great work, Ben. It's it's like just really awesome. Yeah, and I also added a video where Ben explains um, uh, his train of thought behind uh, behind this. So have a look at the chat. I just uh, posted that video from him. You can also follow his account there. Um, on Discord, Ben is uh, B M N. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I think it's really cool. We're going to continue with. Th that notion of, uh, of of running these workshops and giving you challenges to uh, utilize this knowledge and create something because I think uh, that's probably the best way to learn if you really just try. Um, looking at um, what Vlad did here um, can be like, um, oh yeah, that's logical, this makes sense. But then once you actually start to come up with your own ideas and implement them, you actually make the do the learning. Um, so, um, also with this workshop, in, in, another, in, in four weeks time we're going to have another workshop with Vlad. So if you have ideas about sequencers or arpeggiators, um, you can uh, uh, combine them together into something that you design on your own and then share it with us on Discord. Uh, it can be in any language you like, um, uh, just try to make it something that you feel is interesting. And then um, uh, we can uh, have a look at it and feature it in the in the next workshop. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. Let's let's continue, Vlad, with uh, with the workshop of uh, about the sequencer. Okay, so um, as uh, already usual, I can say we can start with um, with a demo. So, as I said already, it's based on the simple board and uh, Daisy Seed. Um, and simple fix board, yeah, the smaller one. There is also bigger version. And um, yeah, so what what do we have here? We have three knobs. Uh, we have switch, and I added also here on this side a push button. So um, what they are doing? Uh, the first knob controls uh, speed and uh, swing or shuffle. Uh, the second one it, it controls a uh, pattern, and this pattern, uh, it can be switched to control pattern of bass drum, snare drum, or hi-hat. Yeah, so three, three, uh, three 
uh, instruments. And the last one uh, uh, controls also controls pattern. It uh, controls the shift of the of the pattern. And this push button is actually switch between switching those knobs between uh, different uh, modes. Yeah. So if I start it, it plays more or less four four to the floor. And then and uh, yeah, here I'm the built in. I don't know if you can see it properly. Built yeah, in. Well, maybe maybe move it slightly to your uh, right. Yes. Uh, yeah, like this. Yep. Yeah. That's better. So. Um, I'm uh, utilizing the uh, built-in this onboard LED to like uh, blink to the uh, to the uh, speed to the BPM, so I can change speed. Also, if I switch the mode now, I can I can change swing. Yeah, here. I can change the pattern of snare drum in this case. And if I switch once again, I can change the same for hi-hat. If I change again, I can change it for bass drum. Yeah, and shift is a, yeah, it's basically just a cyclic shift Yeah, of the same pattern. So it starts not from the beginning, but uh, like uh, with slight, slight delay relative to the to the beginning and this uh, delay is uh, this shift is uh, especially uh, important for even like simple things like this four to the floor because if i just generate a pattern for snare drums it uh, will play uh, on the first and uh, third beat but if i want to play on actually second and fourth i need to shift already so this is like uh, really important even for some small thing. So this is uh, the uh, instruments that we will be looking at today. And also traditionally, uh, let's start with some slides. Um, so uh, everything starts from the clock. Yeah, and in this case, I'm using uh, Metro uh, built in in Daisy Duino. So it's uh, this simple module that uh, uh, generates uh, can generate a slow, uh, clock on given uh, given speed, and then it goes into uh, I call it trigger. Uh, it's actually more or less it's like um, clock divider. Yeah. So uh, original clock. So Metro uh, sends clock uh, forty eight uh, uh, pulses per uh, quarter note. And output is four, so basically just 16, 16 pulses per bar. But besides that, this scene is also responsible for swing. Yeah, so swing actually happening there in this module. Then uh, it drives uh, three uh, identical pattern generators: one for bass drum, one for snare drum, one for hi hat. Uh, which in their turn drive the uh, sound modules. Yeah, so uh, for bass drum and snare drum, I have custom. I built some custom, really simple custom uh, uh, modules. And for hi hat, I'm using uh, uh, hi hat from uh, Daisy Duino examples, which is ported from uh, mutable instruments, as far as I remember. And yeah, every uh, module here represented uh, with uh, separate class. So we have class trigger, we have a class C pattern, which is uh, used like three times. And then uh, class for simple bass drum and simple snare drum and hi-hat is built in. So this is basically the, like, uh, the structure of the instrument itself. And then we have the controls. Yeah, so uh, there is a class multi knob uh, that I built. It uh, allows to route uh, a knob to different parameters. So it actually can be uh, as many parameters as you like. Uh, so 
I would say that without uh, some visual indication, three is uh, like good enough. More is probably a little bit harder already without some visual feedback. So the first, uh, so I uh, I have them three times. This multi knob class router is uh, repeated three times. Uh, one switches between speed and swing, and uh, two. Uh, pattern and, uh, and shift, they switch between different instruments. So in this case, like first routes function, yeah, so it more or less works as a function button, but it's like permanent function button, yeah, like if you if you press it and it remains like this. And the uh, this pattern and shift, they uh, the function remains the same, but it shifts, uh, applies this function to different components. So it's a little bit a different function in this sense. And uh, yeah, let's uh, start with uh, with a trigger. So from left to right, I will first explain what it does and then we will look into the code. So in this case, uh, so the trigger does this like uh, 48 uh, PPQN to four PPQN, so 16, yeah? So we have this 16, uh, 16 nodes. And uh, swing, yeah? So what, what is swing or how Roger Lin uh, called it initially shuffle? It's basically when every second 16 is uh, sh uh, shifted a little bit, a little bit backward. Yeah, so like this, yeah? And if we zoom in to this, uh, so what we see is actually the first, this first high bar is like the first, very first bit. Yeah, so it's like first 16. And then in 12, after 12 pulses of this, uh, of the 40, uh, 48 PPQN clock, we have second 16 and then we have third. Yeah. And I, uh, was looking at uh, a design of um, of LM1 uh, from uh, from uh, Roger Lin, and uh, I came across the uh, interview in Attack magazine. It's still online. You can read it, and I really recommend to go there and read. And where he explains actually where uh, those uh, like when he came up with swing or shuffle, how he called it at, at that time, uh, where those values came from. Yeah, because if you if you look on the panel of the instrument, those values as different percentage, they look a little bit like mysterious. So, and uh, in fact, everything is really, uh, really simple. And actually those values come from more or less like technical constraint. Yeah, so let's see how it's defined. So we have this 48 PPQN and swing value of 50 percent. Yeah, so uh, on uh, lean instrument, it's uh, defined in percents. Yeah, so 50 percent is more or less no swing. Yeah, so it's like straight, uh, straight position. Yeah, so it's like position of the 16 between like in in a one eighth interval, yeah. So twelve by twenty four gives us fifty percent. If we move one step uh, back, then we have fifty four percent. Then one more step, we have like fourteen by twenty four, which is fifty eight percent. Then we have sixty two, and we have sixty six, and then we have seventy. And uh, Roger Lin stopped there, as he explained in the in the interview. It's uh, basically after this uh, swing, uh, like it, it just turns uh, rhythm and something completely different. So it's not swing anymore. And those percentage, that's actually exactly what you what you see if you look on the panel of the LM1. Uh, that's basically where they come from. So there is no like some special consideration behind them. Uh, it's more or less like technical uh, technical constraint that led to the to these values and they work perfectly fine yeah so if, as we all know it's uh, this uh, function what made uh, it's one of things that made instruments uh, like iconic and it's really 
really works. So let's uh, now look quickly into the code. What what's happening here? So it's as usual with C++ class uh, within uh, namespace uh, Cintuix, uh, which I'm using to uh, simplify naming of the of the classes. Yeah, so I can name class just trigger and be, be sure that this name will not clash with some something from a Daisy Duino library or so any any other libraries that I will be using. Yeah, because I'll just add a note here. If you're not sure what this means, go back to the first workshop uh, where Vlad explains uh, why he's doing it in this way. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah, so uh, the class is pretty simple. It has uh, these three, uh, three methods uh, besides, uh, besides constructor. So this first method, which doesn't return anything uh, and is named exactly after the class name, it's a constructor. Uh, and after constructor, so what's happening here it's actually uh, initial, initialization list. So it's an alternative to uh, putting values here. Yeah, so when usually what, what you can see in many cases, uh, uh, when variable is uh, declared, it's also defined. Yeah, so you have some equal and it's uh, equals to something, but uh, more or less like, uh, C++ way of doing it. It's this initialization list, and this um, this notation, it's uh, actually uh, assigning. Yeah, so it's like uh, if you if you write equal, but uh, this notation, it's uh, again, it's like uh, C++ notation, and uh, it's even recommended notation. It has some advantages over over the usual. Uh, usual assignment. So in this case, uh, actually for assigning the simple values, it doesn't make difference. Yeah. So what I put here just to more or less to uh, develop a habit. Yeah. So it's 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 like a habit uh, to write it in in a ways in a standard way. Yeah. In the preferable way, even if it doesn't doesn't do much different for this particular code. Um, so. Uh, the this set swing, it's actually uh, yeah just what we've seen uh, just now. I just take uh, input uh, input value from from the knob, and uh, then I define swing as a, um, a rounding it to the uh, to one of this uh, shifting by uh, by number of uh, of uh, pulses clock pulses. Yeah, so zero shift is 50%, one, two, three, four, five, exactly how we've seen, what we've seen. And uh, tick method, uh, it's uh, called on every uh, tick of the metro. I will show it um, when we will look on the, on the main file. So here it's actually just, just advances, uh, advances this, um, uh, counter and if we um, if we count um, if we uh, if we count uh, the uh, certain amount of of ticks we uh, we issue a trigger like outside that okay now we need to trigger a drum and uh, the final method is reset so it's it just sets everything to zero. Uh, it's called uh, when I stop. So when, when I stop the, the sequencer, it just uh, resets everything. So it always starts from the, from the same position yeah, from, from zero. So this is a trigger, and pretty, pretty simple. But the important thing here that swing actually uh, belongs here. Yeah, so it's not part of the of the pattern itself. Uh, swing is a pattern of of this like triggering mechanism. And actually, when I just started uh, developing for this workshop, first prototype, like first quick prototype, had uh, trigger 
uh, mixed together with a pattern generator. So I had like one track which do did both. But then once once I copied it three times, it was immediately clear that this part, this triggering part, it repeats three times without any changes, without any uh, need for change. Yeah, and that's where I. Uh, there, in this way, it's like like when system starts talking to you and say, "Okay, this scene probably doesn't belong here. It's something different because you see it. It just it just repeats." Yeah. So, uh, just looking, I I would when you design your instrument, I would really recommend to like focus on like listening to the to the system, listening to these like messages from the system because it always like tells you uh can guide you like what what belongs where so this is a trigger and so the next thing that i want to talk about is a pattern generator and uh, pattern generators uh, in this case what i'm doing is uh, what's called euclidean rhythm uh, and basically uh, Euclidean rhythm, I would say, it's it's actually a family of uh, algorithms that can produce this, and all those are algorithms they have um, the same, like uh, more or less, they, they do the same, just different in different ways. So the idea is to distribute certain amount on of onsets as evenly as possible on some amount of uh, amount of uh, slots. In our case, it's sixteen slots. At least in this uh, design, it's fixed to 16. And uh, what what we change is this um, amount of uh, amount of onsets. And uh, there are different algorithms, uh, some more efficient, some less efficient. Uh, what I came came across um, is uh, so-called Christopher Ward. Part, uh, algorithm. Uh, it's from combinatorics, and uh, actually, to ex uh, like it's easy to uh, explain this uh, algorithm like graphically. Yeah, so what what's happening? So we mentioned you have a grid, and on this grid you have a you have a point, and uh, this point has a coordinates. Yeah, so. Horizontal coordinate is nine. Vertical coordinate is seven. Uh, why it's nine and seven? Uh, what is the relation between them? Nine and seven is actually sixteen. Yeah. So uh, in our case, when we talk about like base of sixteen, uh, this uh, this point should be should have coordinates that. Uh, Together gives uh, give us uh, sixteen. Yeah, so it can be like eight eight. Let's say it can be like uh, ten six. So that's basically the idea. And uh, actually, um, in this case, seven this vertical coordinate is actually amount of onsets. So how many onsets will be there? And nine is more or less just a number of empty empty spaces. And then. Uh, so having this point, imagine that we draw a line from zero to this. And now what we want to do, we want to draw a path that is as close to this line as possible, but without crossing this line. So we start uh, with this small vertical step, yeah, so one step up. There are actually two uh, two different uh, two kinds of this crystal words. One is called upper word, another called lower word. So actually, upper what is the different? Upper goes uh, from top of this line, and lower goes from the from the bottom. We are interested in top. Uh, I will explain why in just in a second. So what we do? We just draw the path that doesn't cross the line, but it's as close as possible to this line. Yeah. And now imagine that every step up we replace with one and every step uh, in her, uh, to the right is zero. Yeah. So in this case, we have something like this. Yeah. So one, zero, one. 
which actually gives us the pattern that we are looking for. And that's why we are interested here in upper world, because in upper world, the first step is always vertical. Yeah, it's always one. And we want our pattern to start with the, from the uh, from the first uh, from the first bit. We can then vary it uh, with a, with a shift. Yeah, with a cyclic shift. Actually, all those algorithms, like different algorithms that can produce the same result, they produce the same result up to cyclic shift. Yeah. So if you like shift a couple of steps left to right, they all can be uh, can match each other. So. Another interesting uh, interesting uh, property of this generated pattern this way is that if we take all steps in uh, except the first one and last one, it's palindrome, which means that it's like from left to right and right to left, it's exactly the same. And the actual algorithm that uh, does this uh, we don't need to draw anything graphically. It's a really simple series of uh, really simple series of uh, arithmetic uh, operations. And I learned about uh, those operations in a book uh, called uh, Creating Rhythms. It's written by Stefan Hollis and uh, Richard Hollis. And yeah, with a kind permission from authors, I I want to share it with you. Uh, so here's the algorithm. Actually, can you can you see the code properly? Maybe I should make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, would it? Would uh, it yeah, I think it's always good to make it a bit bigger. Um, and if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat, and I'll make sure Vlad uh, takes a break and ask them. So feel free to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, this this is Absolutely. fascinating. I loved I loved just listening to you. This was really cool. Uh, um, but yeah, guys, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to to drop them in the chat. Um, okay, so. Uh... Again, here what we have, uh, if you look on the class itself, we have again initializer uh, or uh, constructor with initialization list, just like I've uh, shown you in the trigger. Then we have this shift and we have uh, maximum unsets. I will explain a little bit later why we need, uh, why I decided to limit it. Yeah, and this is basically the algorithm itself. So what, uh, so the algorithm to generate it is actually just just this line so as you can see it's uh, um, it just stepping one by uh, one by one through this uh, through this path like by adding adding coordinates yeah so more or less it's 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 like doing uh, like doing this but uh, in like this simple way so it's uh, really fast really efficient there is no even multiplications here it's just additions and um, uh, what, uh, what's uh, important about this algorithm that uh, basically Christopher Wards, they uh, like standard Christopher Wards, let's say, uh, the like prerequisite that those coordinates that I uh, just shown you in the beginning, these coordinates of the points, they should be uh, uh relatively prime numbers yeah so they're uh common um uh, common uh divider yeah divider i guess uh should be one yeah so it's like uh seven and nine let's say yeah so all all uh, this kind of um numbers uh, but if it's like uh if they are not uh, technically, this algorithm can also work with um, uh, with numbers that are not relatively prime, like four and eight, let's say. But what does it do in this case? It just stops early. So, because if you have like two prime numbers, I didn't prepare a slide for that. But if you have uh, prime numbers, all this path is will be just a like repetition of the same like. Uh, of the same pattern, and this algorithm will stop after after generating the first part of it. So if we want like four on sets, it will generate four on sets and then stop, uh, or one on set. Sorry, so one on set and stop. 
Yeah, so it will just create the first portion, the first quota. And for this, uh, I added the second part here, which just if sees if uh, if the the land less than our 16 size that we defined, it's actually uh, just copies it over until it fills the entire uh, the entire bar, and that's basically it. Yeah. Uh, you may probably ask why do we need algorithm here? Why not just predefine those uh, how many 16 yeah 16 uh, patterns and put them here. And in this particular design we probably could do it. We should then uh, probably compare the size of the resulting code because it can can happen that actually this lookup table will be even bigger than than the code itself. I don't know. but um, the thing is that, it works with lookup tables uh, if uh, the base is fixed. But if we want to change the length of the of the bar, let's say we do base drum like six, 16, and we do snare drum like, I don't know, 12, and we do so something that will just somehow overlap in some, some strange ways and generate some involving patterns. In this case, we've we cannot just come up with some and we want actually to distribute uh, not just cut you know, cut those patterns but we want to distribute uh, differently then uh, probably algorithm will work better yeah, in this case so anyways this is uh, uh, this is one of the algorithms that i find really uh, really uh, great, it's simple, it's efficient, and yeah, as I said uh, already, it's uh, used also in Spotikach, uh, and yeah, so that's that's basically how this thing works. Uh, tick method here does more as the same as uh, um, as a trigger, yeah, but in this case, it looks on the points of the uh, of the generated pattern. And if pattern, if the point is one, then it uh, outputs tick, which means that we will trigger the the drum. Uh, reset does the same as in trigger. It also just resets uh, to to the beginning. And uh, this maximum unsets, uh, I added it here because I thought that. Uh, Okay, for let's say hi hat to have 16 on sets, it's probably fine. For snare drum, it's also probably fine. But for bass drum, it's not that often that you need like 16 on, on sets. Uh, from the other side, uh, probably it's uh, like reducing this number of like range of on sets will allow to um, change it like more in more controllable way, which is important for bass drum yeah because it's like the way how it works will be really um like impact the the whole um the whole pattern a lot so uh for this particular case i added this setting and for uh, for bass drum i'm limiting this uh, maximum number of onsets to eight yeah so it can like do bass drum on every eight note not 16. So, yeah, and this is basically uh, the, uh, the pattern generator. And I have three of them and there. They're absolutely identical. Uh, so what's left? Uh, we have uh, a simple... So my first idea was to use... Um, uh, the drums from uh, from Daisy Duino, from examples, yeah. So analog bass drum, analog snare drum, and hi hat. But uh, yeah, looking on on them, it was quickly uh, clear that they are too uh, too expensive uh, in terms of computation power, and it's just it just doesn't work if you put all three of them. So I wanted to come up with something simpler actually why they're expensive and uh, what what's happening there uh nick uh explained really great in the last workshop 
all the all the details about the sporting and what what was done and how so if you haven't watched it yet i really recommend to to go and watch it and uh yeah so uh, this uh, bass drum and snare drum uh they are actually identical from like uh c components point of view what they're using so it's just usual usual mix uh, of oscillator noise generator and uh, envelope in this case i don't even um uh, modulate uh, pitch to have a like click in the beginning it's really like simple i would say even naive way of to naive way to generate uh, generate bass drum uh, so yeah so I have this oscillator with a sine wave which is also not not the most optimized uh, let's say oscillator but still it's way cheaper than than um, uh, analog bass drum and uh, yeah so I have a little bit of noise mixed in uh, to have a, a little bit of this like feel of the so it's not not just a just a sine wave and uh, the main difference uh, or another difference from snare drum is that here i have this uh, 40 milliseconds so gate is open for 40 milliseconds so it has some some body and uh, if you look at simple sd it's actually the same uh, more or less the only difference is that here I have the triangular wave uh, also to, to add a little bit of uh, a little bit of tone to it and it's tuned to different frequencies so bass drum is tuned to 50 and uh, this one tuned to 100 and uh, yeah it's shorter it doesn't have this long body so even even simpler than than the bass drum and with this let's look how all this uh, comes together in in the main file in this so it's like relatively big but more or less it's big because of uh, because of uh, repetition of the uh, of the elements yeah so uh, this is uh, this is metro from the uh, from library then we have trigger we have three times pattern generator we have uh, sound modules themselves and uh, yeah here we have actually those multi knob uh, classes uh, so before them here it's uh, just the definitions of the of the pins of knob pins uh, I uh, back in the days I made a helper uh, file for a simple board uh, to which maps uh, pins of uh, daisy seed to pins of the to footprints of the simple so here I'm using it to uh, to uh, the file itself is this simple daisy so it just uh, contains this uh, mappings and uh, I'm using it here to define knobs and then I have uh, here this uh, uh, three multi knobs uh, let's probably look at them uh, first so multi knob is uh, so first of all it's not a knob at all I just called it a knob but in fact it's just a router you can route anything through it any and you can even chain them yeah, so, uh, they don't read anything from pins they just get some value and uh, output some values so uh, what uh, what do I have here is uh, so first of all I have array and in this case, I'm using this is uh, I'm to define array. I'm using array from standard C C++ standard library. So this is CD array, and I would uh, really recommend to use it whenever you can, uh, because it's uh, 
doesn't have overhead comparing to like usual array. Uh, from the other side, it's a really convenient container. So what uh, what this definition says is it's array of uh, uint 16t uh, values. And here the count, and this is one of, one of the like advantages of the array. It's array which knows its size. Yeah. So usually, if you uh, if you work with uh, with the usual uh, with the usual array with plain array, you need to and you want to pass it, you need to somewhere uh, have the uh, the uh, index. Yeah. So you need to also pass the position in this array. And uh, the size of this, uh, not a position, but the size of this array, yeah, you need to pass it uh, separately. Uh, but uh, in this case, array know knows its size. You don't need additional variable for it. Also, what is great about this array is that you can actually pass it inside the method and assign it directly. So here I have this variable values. Uh, and in initializer of this multi knob in constructor, I pass the this values array. And what I'm doing, I'm just directly assigning it here. With uh, uh, with plain array, to do this, you need to pass array itself. You need to pass the pass uh, to, to the size, and then you need to uh, you cannot just assign one array to another. You need to enumerate through the array and pass those values there. So uh, this container is really convenient. And uh, yeah, whenever you uh, work with array, consider consider using it. Uh, to use it, you need to include this array uh, into, the, into your file. And uh, yeah, so uh, this array, uh, contains actually output values, yeah, and that's why it, this class is actually a template class. So if we look here again, I define so here I define multi knob two. It means that it will contain two uh, output two values, yeah, and uh, this will output three, and then here I actually pass in the array of initial values. Yeah, so, and uh, it will even, like, it will not compile if I pass the wrong number of, uh, wrong count, array of the wrong size in this case. Because here, this parameter out, uh, out count that I have as a temp in a template, this de template declaration, it's used already in the, uh, in the uh, multi uh, in the uh, array. Uh, constructor in the multi uh, constructor with array parameter, and um, also uh, it uh, yeah so it's basically fixed in this case yeah so uh, because everything that we define here is uh, when we create all those objects they are statically initialized so we cannot define this size. Uh, somewhere afterwards, we need to know it in the beginning, and we don't want to. Uh, we could maybe define array with some size just in case, like 16 values, and use only two of them or something. But first of all, we just use extra memory for this. Second, it's it just not uh, uh, doesn't look good. Yeah. So template in this case allows us to actually define exactly what we are working with yeah so how how many values we want to to route to and uh yeah so this uh, uh this knob the main uh, the main uh function of this uh, happens in this process method which uh accepts knob value and selector pin so this selector pin high value uh, this boolean comes actually from this push button that I showed in, in the beginning. So once this push button is pressed, this uh, goes to next next value in this values array. Yeah, so the knob will uh, will uh, adjust the second value. If you press once again, it will adjust third value. If you press again, it, it goes again to the first value. So it's it's really simple. Uh, 
and it's one of the ways, of course, how you can do it. Uh, one thing here that I have is this sensitivity, uh, because uh, especially working with, uh, like, if we allow, uh, like, at least 10, uh, 10 bits uh, resolution on uh, knobs, so values, uh, then uh, sometimes it, there is a jitter. So how how this thing is designed is that it doesn't change value until you turn the knob. Yeah, so its behavior more or less similar to uh, cork Volca. Yes, there you have uh, the same more or less the same behavior. If you switch between different different uh, samples, let's say in in Volca sample, then all those knobs they don't change. Uh, until you turn them, but when you turn, it tur it changes immediately to the to the value of the knob. Yeah, so it's like uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't do like relative change. It does like absolute value. Yeah, so what what knob says, and this behavior is more or less what this thing does. And to prevent this accidental turn of the knob, detection of this turn of the knob, I have this sensitivity value set, and I set it by default to three, I guess, so plus mi minus three, which on uh, 1023 scale, not too big, not too much, but this uh, ensures that if I, once I switch, it doesn't like change immediately. Yeah? It actually waits until I until I turn the knob, but uh, at a price of reduced um, uh, resolution of the of the knob, which is totally fine. In this case, we don't uh, we don't do any like changes, uh, like continuous changes of some like frequencies or something like this. It's pretty uh, like uh, discrete changes. And yeah, so I have um, three of them. Yeah. Uh, with uh, initial values set uh, relative to 1023 uh, maximum value. So first is uh, 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 for tempo, zero is for swing. Uh, this is actually positions of the uh, uh, number of onsets. Yeah, so originally it's four, four to the floor, so four to 16. And yeah, from the, from the very beginning, the shift uh, for uh, snare is already like one quarter, so it plays on second and fourth bit. And yeah, so next we have some variables here, just a trigger, uh, trigger variables that will track if if we have to trigger, uh, to trigger the the drum. Uh, this is a calculation of the of the speed yeah from 40 to uh, 240 I just calculate pre-calculate uh, the uh, coefficients uh, so I can use them uh, later I don't need to recalculate them again I'm using them in in loop and uh, yeah here we have uh, audio callback um, which is yeah uh, what does it do? It just uh, says metro process. And then uh, here I have a little code uh, for blinking this uh, built in um, LED. Uh, so instead of like doing a digital write directly from here, I am just setting this blink uh, variable to true or false. And then digital write happens actually in loop method so it's more or less like opposite to what we have usually yeah so usually we set some variables in loop and then we uh it's more or less used here in audio callback but this is like opposite it's uh, audio callback like left some value for loop to take it and pick it up and uh, adjust the led accordingly and uh yeah here basically what's uh uh, where the triggering happens. So if uh, T is again is a, a tick from the metro, and then uh, it uh, checks if trigger also uh, our clock divider uh, with swing already also triggers something. And if it does, then we check if 
pattern should uh, if we need to uh, to trigger uh, at this particular step of the pattern and if so then we trigger and we assume the the um, outputs from from bass drum snare drum hi hat uh, snare drum and hi hat are multiplied to like bring them a little bit down otherwise they are just too loud comparing to bass drum and yeah setup uh, method just um, does usual usual stuff that if you will expect it to do yeah so it initializes bass drum and here i said bass drum uh, pattern maximum and sets eight to limit it and uh, snare drum doesn't require too much uh, hi-hat requires a little bit more initialization so this is uh, daisy, uh, daisy uh, examples uh, hi-hat so here i added some some values to to like make it sound good with uh with uh, bass and snare and uh, those are initializer for uh switches so this is uh play stop switch no this is play stop switch this is push button and uh this is led built-in led and yeah, so loop actually that's where where it reads all those parameters, and uh, routes it to the uh, to the particular instrument or function depending on the on the switch. Yeah, so uh, so bass drums, snare drum, hi hat. It reads value on different indexes, and here actually uh, happening this. Uh, uh, bringing it to to like normalization of those parameters yeah otherwise in in the uh, multi knob class i don't care about floats everything is uh, integer based so it's like simple and fast and yeah here actually happening this digital right to blink to make make this in blink and yeah with this basically that's that's all about it. So pretty, pretty simple, uh, but yeah, I guess uh, interesting instrument. Definitely, it's it's beautiful. I, I I love the structure of this, and I think that um, what's what's really interesting is how the 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 sequencer is grabbing all the um, the data from the different classes. Um, and it is pretty straightforward the way that you the way that you explain it. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, now is the time. Um, Vlad, did you have anything else to to share about this? Do you want to maybe play it again to kind of like wrap things up and show how this actually applies in real life? Uh, yeah. So uh, help me to put it into yeah, right yeah, position. It's, it's good. Yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. okay. So once again, uh, so just what we, ah, okay. If I, I can also uh, remove. Maybe let's completely. start from, from scratch, from like a really basic. Uh, yes, I guess I can reset it. Yeah. Yeah. So what I, what I can do also, of course I can uh, remove one of those drums. And that's basically um, why I added this LED uh, blinking that if I have only one, so if if I have at least two drums, it's already easier to like understand the pattern itself, yeah, how it will how it will be. Mm -hmm. But if I adjust only one drum, because I can adjust them one by one, if I just remove them, yeah, I can I can have only only the on the hi hat let's say yeah and uh, if i turn all others to to zero yeah. uh, but in this case it's a little bit harder to understand uh what at which beat it actually plays so this visual blinking helps a little bit to to understand so let's bring uh and also what what uh, actually was Uh, 
uh, what was surprising for me also when I started that plane is it that I thought that with uh, with knobs it will be like hard to like really play with it, but it was actually opposite. With with knobs it uh, like really turns it into really like performance instrument. Yeah, so you can really change uh, change the behavior, uh, make some feels. Yeah, so something you can really do it like in real time. You can really play play with the pattern. Yeah, so it's... Yeah, I feel like it actually asks for like larger knobs, so it feels a bit more like tactile. Uh, but yeah, I totally, I totally agree. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty uh, cool that that with like three knobs, you could actually get so much variety and, and performance ability. Yeah, and uh, this is not the not the end. Actually, the uh, original idea that I have in the very beginning is to add also like function knob. So you change between mm. bass drum, snare drum, and hi hat, and you also have this function knob that you can like immediately switch between two. But then I thought that okay, it will be probably a little bit too much of the like. But that that's what you can do actually. Yeah. You can uh, with couple of uh, couple of push buttons you can really extend uh, extend it and yeah. uh, and Maybe. considering that knob is actually uh, like really can be anything it can be encoder it can be switch it can be knob it can be whatever it's really great yeah Maybe maybe something for, for you guys to think about if you want to take that challenge and, and design a sequencer um, on your own uh, again, in whatever um, programming language you 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 feel more comfortable working with, um, just um, conceptually in the design, uh, like thinking about the design and the user interaction, how would you use this knowledge that you now uh, received and how you would actually apply it on something uh, small? And please share it with us on on Discord, and we can share it with everyone um, in the next uh, episode of of these workshops. Um, yeah, if you can um, um, like uh, and drop a comment on the video, that would be highly appreciated. It really helps uh, to beat the algorithm of YouTube and, and, and bring us uh, more, uh, more people like us. Um, and um, yeah, Vlad, do you have anything else to, to add? Uh, yeah, I would probably uh, finish at, at this point. So yeah, I guess it's cool. already... Um, yeah, so um, thanks so much, Vlad, and thank you everyone who uh, joined us. Um, yep. Again, uh, if you want to support the initiative, um, we are on Discord and on the website you can uh, get one of the kits. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, let us know if you have any particular questions or particular topics you would like us to cover in future workshops. Uh, we're very open to, to consider all sorts of ideas. And um, yeah, thanks so much for joining and we'll see you online. Thanks, see you. Bye-bye.